My name is Samante. Um, I am an artist that lives in uh, Nelson, BC, Sinaiq's territory. And um, I'm really excited to have some very special guests with us tonight. Um, but before we get started with the panelists, um, I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee um, just to say a few words about uh, the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council and our funders. I promise I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I'm the executive director of the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council. Thanks everyone for joining us. If you're not familiar with the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council, we serve the West Kootenays, the East Kootenays, and the top of the Columbia Basin all the way up to Van Lund. So if you're in that area, you should know us and check out our website because we offer some grants. <laughs> so if you're interested in uh, local funding and applying for some local uh, arts grants, we're opening our next funding cycle in January. So I really encourage you to take a look at that if that's relevant to you. We also amplify the work of local and regional artists through a magazine called Articulate. So you can pick that up in print for throughout the area. We also have that on our website. And we run a really fantastic uh, summer showcase of artisans and artists and cultural venues. That's called the Columbia Basin Culture Tour. So that's something you may be interested in registering for as well. We also offer professional development events like this one. And on that note, I'd like to thank the BC Arts Council for making this possible tonight. Shout out to the BC Arts Council. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, I will throw it back to all of you. Thank you for being here. I will make my tiny little screen disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kaylee. And yeah, um, I'm really super uh, thankful for the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council. Uh, they helped um, Bent on Art happen. Um, Bent on Art is a festival for queer trans artists in the region. Um, so they were our, our uh, partners. And yeah, hopefully we'll be having more of them in the future. Uh, so to start, I uh, just want to say... Um, Everybody's welcome to just take care of themselves in this session. It's going to be just kind of a, a casual conversation. Uh, you will have opportunities to submit questions uh, toward the end to the panelists. Um, but yeah, if you need to turn your screen off, uh, take a break, um, we will be we are recording this session, so people will have the option to view it later. Um, and then uh, to start, I think maybe what we'll do is just have the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, you can say your name, your pronouns, anything you'd like to share around access needs, and then maybe just a little bit about um, kind of what uh, kind of art you do or what kind of um, business you run, creative business you run. And yeah, we'll kind of go from there. Anyone want to start? I can start. Uh, my name is um, Cyrus Marcus Ware. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I might forget some of the things that we're supposed to say. Uh, I'm calling in from Tagorando or Toronto, colonially known as Toronto. Uh, I'm actually in the part of uh, Toronto, Toronto that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase. So this is the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, Three Fires Territory, home to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. It's great to be here. Um, uh, I can't remember if there was something else I was supposed to say. Uh, just a little bit about uh, your art practice or business that you want to share. Yeah, so I'm a, as I mentioned, I'm a, a scholar, an artist, and an activist. I'm, I teach at McMaster University uh, in theater and film and also in interdisciplinary arts. I've been a visual artist and performance artist for about 26 years and have been making work mostly about uh, social justice frameworks and Black activist culture and disability justice. Um, and really trying to think through these things through a creative lens. Um, I do very large scale drawings, six feet tall, sorry, 12 feet tall by six feet wide, uh, performance works and video works as well. Um, and I'm really excited about the possibility of doing what Tony Cade Bambera encouraged us to do in 82, which was to use our art to make irresistible revolutions. So uh, my work is very political. Um, it's art and activism together. Um, I've been an activist for 26 years as well, so they've always gone hand in hand. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited 
to be here thinking through alternative ways that we can fund and make our work happen and make our work possible. Um, because I've been somebody who has, uh, you know, found funding in a lot of different streams, both, uh, you know, the traditional methods, but also the non traditional roads. So I'm uh, really excited to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great. We're happy to have you. Um, would anyone like to go next? I'll go. Um, hi, my name's um, Hannah. I, I use the artist name Frizz Kid. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an illustrator and a writer. Um, it's hard to say business-wise because I have struggled a lot over the past few years to make art into a business. And I actually very recently had to make the decision to shut down my online store come January. So uh, <laughs> bringing a little dose of reality right now about what it's like actually, um, you know, trying to make a living as an artist. Um, but, uh, and, and, and balancing that with, you know, day jobs and things like that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to share with people like a little bit about what I do and the type of illustration I do, but also just like what kind of goes into um, trying to make a living, but also trying to like honor your work and um, stay passionate about art. And, uh, and in the writing side of it, I have um, two books out, uh, one book of poetry and illustration. The second is, um, essays with illustration and then I have a third book coming out next fall which is exciting which is going to be poetry and illustration so um also happy to talk about that or if anybody had any questions about publishing because I know that's a, a difficult thing I'm also happy to answer that <laughs> awesome thank you and yeah like we want this to be in real life situations so sometimes it means we have to close the door to open another one or make space for something else in our lives. So um, yeah, we welcome it all. All right. Next I think up. I'm next. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Brienne Huntsman and I use she, her pronouns. I am in the Salt Lake Valley, which has um, unseceded territories from the Paiute, uh, Shoshone, and Ute. Uh, nations here in Utah. Um, I'm one of those friends that when people ask me what I do, I kind of laugh. But so I make visual art through my platform, The Huntswoman, um, talking a lot about like body positivity, um, sex positivity, and uh, queer issues, and also engaging in um, white supremacy and conversations around that. And then I also have a consulting marketing business where I help creatives like negotiate different kinds of influencer deals, um, as well as uh, business coaching for usually just people who are solopreneurs, uh, one to five employees. Um, so yeah, I'm just, just all over the place over here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be a common theme of the evening, which is like all of us do a lot of different things in order to uh, fund our our work and our lives. So um, I think I think, you know, our goal really is to help queer and trans artists in the Kootenai region um, build sustainable art practices. And that often means looking at lots of different ways to bring in um, money so we can keep going with our work. So um, I'd be curious to kind of hear how you all spend your time, like what kind of work-related tasks outside of like the art making or like the creativity, um, like what's a breakdown of how your time is distributed you know, in a day, in a week, in a month, whatever you'd like to share. Um, I'll say that like that my time often feels chaotic because um, you're balancing a day job with also trying to like produce art. And, and I think that some of the things that some artists struggle with is trying to keep up social media presence because we're kind of told like it has to be really, um, consistent and so you're like oh I have to put my art online I have to show people and they're that so like balancing that time um but then also focusing on other things like um Patreon and stuff like that's where I you know I try to like do things there and then you know for a while I was like managing my website so it's like it's kind of chaotic um and 
I think it's like also important for people to find ways to like not like like plan downtime because it can be hard when you're doing lots of different things to have that so yeah I think I saw a meme the other day that was like are you glad you fit your nine nine to five so that you can work 24 hours a day on your business <laughs> which I really related to <clears throat> Yeah, I, I definitely, I was working at a large art gallery. I worked at the AGO for, uh, you know, 13 or 14 years. And, um, you know, that was my my every day, you know, and I chose to, to make a leap in 2014 and to go and become a full-time artist. And it was really scary. Uh, and yet I'm so glad that I did it. Um, and, you know, in the end, it's been really a great opportunity. So the way that I spend my time uh now is i always have i try to build downtime throughout the day because i'm not the i'm i work a lot i like to be busy um but i like to have my first hour of the day be sort of quiet you know i have my coffee and i kind of think about it. and i do a little social media uh you know here i'm very I have a very active instagram but it's usually in the morning i'll just you know find some things and put some stuff on there and then um usually work do a little bit of computer time in the morning because that's when my brain can kind of work so grants um you know final reports uh you know research creation writing um and then uh if i can i uh, do some creative or drawing or or or, or hands-on work um i'll often do that in the afternoon i'm an artist parent so that's another factor to right. add <laughs> you're a parent you're also doing it around you know someone else's life uh and you know suppers that need to be made and dinners and and pickups from aftercare and all that so then i'll usually go pick up my daughter and then we'll have some supper together and then I do a little bit of work before she after she goes to bed um but I don't do a lot of heavy work at night I do draw at night I I can work uh in a creative flow very easily at night but writing things that have to be coherent to other people not good for me at night so <laughs> I try not to do that at night I just try to do things that I can kind of not have to where I can get into a flow state and not have to use my thinking brain necessarily front of mind so that's kind of how I spend my days and the days are pretty similar on the weekend I like to try to do a little bit more outdoor stuff uh, if possible but um, I kind of flow my day to have these periods of different kinds of activity based on what I what my brain and my body can physically do I love that. I love, I love that approach. Just kind of seeing where your uh, strengths are during different times of the day. That's like super helpful um, for sure. Thank you for sharing. All right. I'm really good at talking over people on Zoom because there's sometimes a delay. So if you're like, Brianne, like, are you <laughs> going to talk? That is what's going on. Over no worries. Um, so I, I took some notes and I'm just going to press enter in the chat. So maybe that would be helpful for other people. Uh, on a daily basis, I find that I have the most energy in the mornings. So when people are like, the muse comes at 2 a.m., I'm like, I cannot relate. <laughs> like, they are at, here at 6 a.m. or they're not showing up. So, um, and then normally what I do is Friday to Sunday or Friday to Monday-ish is focusing on like art and creative work. And I do include like my blog. I have a blog that supports my um, art that we can talk about if you guys would like. And then Tuesday to Thursday, um, I keep to client work. So like consulting or I write a lot of documents and review contracts and stuff. So that's Tuesday to Thursday. And then something that's been helpful for me is unpacking this idea that um, there are, that you should be working eight hours a day, like that you should be having like eight hours a day of productive brain time. Studies have really shown that people usually have like anywhere from like two and a half to max four hours. And if your brain works differently, like that is totally fine. But I found that to be really true for myself. So the first three hours of my working day, I really try to prioritize on, um, and content warning for discussion of death here really quick. I'll go like this again, when you can come back in and unmute me. Um, is I ask myself like, okay, you're, you're cremated and it's done. Like, what do you want to make sure that you 
day with your creative work. So that's what the, that three hours of the day is dedicated to. Um, and then with regards to social media, I will download the apps and like time engagement because you can't just post and leave, right? Like you have to talk to people, they're social, right? Um, and then I'll actually delete the app from my phone. I have massive ADHD. Oh, I should wait so you can come back in. I have massive ADHD. Um, so if TikTok is on my phone, like it's over, nothing's happening. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about this is I've also found that there is like a seasonal effect on my work. So I, at the end of every calendar year, I do like a retrospective looking at when things happened and what I learned from that year, and what I want to do in the next year. And something that I realized in the last few years is that March and April and July are just very low energy, very low, like just things going on. So, and November and December is really active for me. So it's been helpful to understand how my energy changes throughout the year when it comes to doing creative work. That was a lot, but there you go. No, I love it. That's great. I feel like it also, yeah, relates to what other folks are saying in terms of just like, you know, when you're doing certain types of work, um, I think I, th I have I have also embraced the fact that there's like ebbs and flows and like when I'm in an ebb, it's nothing's happening. <laughs> so it's, there's no point in uh, trying to force myself to do it. Um, just kind of embrace the flow states and uh, yeah, try to try to not not be too hard on myself when I'm not in that state. Um, awesome. Well, I feel like all of you have um like amazing social media presence like that's how I know all of you I've seen your faces on the internets and I look forward to seeing your posts and I think for a lot of artists uh a lot of us are introverts or just feel like super overwhelmed with the thought of like content creation <laughs> and just like how overwhelming that kind of feels and seems to people I wonder what how each of you feel about it and kind of maybe what your strategy is in terms of like making it sustainable for yourselves or like boundaries you put with yourself as in terms of like deleting the apps so you're not going to be on them for hours on end that kind of a thing um yeah does anybody have anything like like to share along those lines Uh, I'll, I'll go first, I guess. Oh, wait, no, actually, you know, you go. Because I, no, you go. <laughs> oh, we got the Zoom standoff. No, it's okay. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying hard not to just real talk to that white girl that talks the whole time. So there we go. Um, I think the, so when I was in design school, my professors had us do this thing where we would set a timer on our phone and every 15 minutes we would take a photo of our work to then just document the process and understand what was happening, but also um, to share on social media. So I think that my number one piece of advice for artists who are worried about the content is number one, don't get like meta in your head because creating the content can also be its own form of digital art. And so if you want it to be, that's great or it can just be a documented process. So I would just, you know, get your dinky little tripod out and just record yourself creating art. A lot of artists, we have friends who are also artists. And so we're like, nobody needs to watch me, like for me, like cutting fabric. I'm like, that is not interesting. But when I put it up on social media, everyone is very excited about it. <laughs> so I'd also remember that like your patrons or your potential customers, your fans, whatever verbiage we're wanting to use are gonna be really impressed with like things that you, that feel kind of like almost like loading the dishwasher. Like they're just not sexy. Um, and the other thing that I would say is every social media platform has its own personality to me. So you don't need to be omnipresent on all social media platforms. I would just find platforms where you feel comfortable sharing and existing and then just share on those platforms. It's better to do one, maybe two platforms and like really try than try to be like dialed into the matrix. Awesome. That's great advice. Uh, 
Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, absolutely this idea that, uh, you know, pick the ones that work for you. Like I am very, very active on Instagram. Um, and, you know, I just know that I'm a very visual person. I like to think of the world in pictures and I, I it's just natural to me to think of the world in this sort of image based quality. I'm not somebody who um, makes a lot of videos. You know, so the on Instagram, you can have videos as an option, but like on TikTok, it's kind of all videos or not at all, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I don't do a lot of things on TikTok because I don't make a lot of videos. So, um, you know, similarly, I found, you know, the quality of um, the communities different on these apps. So I often found that on Twitter was a little more nasty like I just found it a little harsher and that there was more um, I mean it's where I got the most hate mail it's where I got the most sort of n-word emails you know like wow. some, some of that uh, stuff so I, I avoided Twitter you know largely um, although I watched with popcorn as it started to crumble <laughs> the last couple of weeks yeah but you know so I found the ones that worked for me and so for the ones that worked for me were the more visual based apps so I've really enjoyed uh, doing Instagram and I guess what I would say is I actually don't even think about what I'm doing as being content creation like I'm just kind of playing you know it's part of my art practice it's part of what uh, it's part of my activism as well because I'll make these little meme carousels that have things that I just genuinely have found funny in the day um, but then I'll slip in like a info about a rally or info about a you know what's happening in uh, you know a, a particular community that needs a bit more spotlight or more attention or more focus so it becomes a sort of engaged dialogue with you know this sort of humor but also political activism um, and then I often do include a lot of process images of my uh, visual art practice and my theater practice because I think people are genuinely interested in seeing some of the behind the scenes and um, I'll do time lapse uh, videos of my drawings and you know it's really fun actually I like being able to sort of see the process and I'm the one who's drawing it so I imagine other people might enjoy that as well and so you know just kind of playing with that and I talk with Adrian um uh my friend adrian marie brown a lot about this because we, we we both have a very similar we and we often repost each other's uh content but um we talk about this idea of sort of kind of getting in and getting out you know so that it doesn't end up becoming this thing that you're sort of spending hours a day thinking through what you're going to make or post but rather something that you can kind of do quickly Maybe and that's why I do it in the morning when I start my day and I do a little bit in the evening before I go to bed. And, you know, it's just kind of a, a way of it not taking up all of the time. But I'm also not stressing about it because I do find, you know, I really root this idea uh, of disability justice where we build communities online and that it's actually OK to spend a lot of time online for some of us who um, are immunocompromised or who, you know, for a variety of reasons can't physically get out of our apartments all the time, we do spend a lot of our lives online and that that's okay. So I don't stress or like obsessively check how many hours a day I've spent on Instagram because I'm okay with whatever that number is going to be because that's what needed to happen that day. So anyways, get in, get out, but also don't stress about it. And I just try to, you know, post things that I genuinely find interesting rather than trying to think through a strategy of like, oh, this is going to attract more people or this is, I, I, I just, I'm genuinely sort of curating things that I think are interesting uh, personally. Yeah. I love that. I think a lot of people feel like they have to have this like content calendar and like, you know, these like funnels and like things, you know, very long term, very structured way. But I actually so look forward to your meme dumps. I'm like, oh, what, what are you gonna post today? And I'm always just like cracking up and sharing with my friends. And yeah, I think it's an awesome way to show up. Um, and, you know, every once in a while, there'll be a picture of you in, in the carousel and you're like, oh, yay. So I think I think that's a really helpful approach because I think for a lot of artists, we can get overwhelmed with just like all the things because it's like art and then all the one million things related to that you didn't realize you were signing up for. Um, so, yeah. Was there anything you'd like to share? Um, <clears throat> sorry. I mean, I, I, I think that Bran and Cyrus made like great points. Um, I, I don't really have too much to add, only that um, I've noticed engagement's been very different on Instagram in the last 
couple of years. Um, and like by different, I mean, engagement has like dramatically gone down. Like I probably had more engagement three years ago when I had less followers than I do now. And so what I, what I hope to convey with that is that um, it's, if, if you're putting it out there and you're making work that you're happy with, don't stress too much about the numbers because those numbers can really quickly become something that you obsess over and um, it, it can feel demoralizing to, you know, put things out there that are, is, you know, coming from your heart and people are not responding to it in the way that you wanted them to. Um, so try to just like be proud of the work that you're doing and just, just leave the rest, you know, to, I don't know, the universe. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's true. I feel like, um, you know, we can sometimes like feel trapped by the algorithms and, um, you know, trying to constantly chase whatever the new update is. But I think, I think you're right. I think just showing up, putting out what you're doing and then, yeah, moving on is probably a, a good, a good approach. Um, I'm actually curious about, um, I heard that you run a uh, Patreon. So I'm actually kind of curious about, I know a lot of people, um, were kind of asking about, what that might look like in terms of um like what kinds of things you put on there how you kind of structure it maybe how many um uh people um, you have supporting you there um so i don't have a ton of patrons i've got 39 but they're 39 great people and it's been very consistent um i don't post a ton on my patreon i post some updates the main reason that they're there is they get goodies in the mail. So it's more of like a physical reward. Patreon will work a little bit differently for people who might be doing video content and stuff because they'll like, you can get access to like early videos and things like that. Um, that's not how I've structured mine. I've made it like um, the lowest tier is like a dollar. So that's just for if you're like, I want to support this artist, but like I don't have a ton of resources. I'm just going to give them a dollar a month. Like it sounds little, but you know, if like a hundred people sign up to give you a dollar, you get a hundred dollars a month, which is great. We can use that for art supplies or whatever. Um, so I, and yeah, so I structure mine more like um, the $5 and up tiers, you get stuff in the mail. Um, and it's nice. Cause I just like, they get like prints and buttons and bookmarks and things like that. And I decorate the envelopes with lots of stickers and write thank you notes and it's nice like it's honestly the thing that's been the most consistent for me over the past few years because obviously like I as I mentioned before I'm closing my online store because the fees like I literally wasn't making any money I was losing money because of all of the fees and just trying to keep up with it whereas Patreon like it's you know it's like free to use I'm not I don't have to pay to like be on there I just gotta be on there right and like if you lose a patron it's you know you're not gonna necessarily, like, yeah, you're losing money because you lost a patron, but like, then you're also making less prints to send out to people. So you know what I mean? Like you can balance it. It's, it's a little bit easier to balance than like trying to um, like sell things, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it is something, I, I think Patreon's really nice. And like, I know some people also use the co the coffee app where you can like buy like an artist a cup of coffee, which I think is honestly really sweet. I, I think it's important for people to know that there's like really small ways that you can support an artist. Like it doesn't have to be grand. You don't have to like, commission me to make like a giant painting I mean that'd be cool I'd love that but you don't have to do that you can there's there's small ways that you can support someone and sometimes like the small things it means a lot to an artist because it's hard getting paid for doing art so it's nice <laughs> when people want to you know throw a dollar my way that's great that's one more dollar that I have <laughs> <laughs> totally every little bit every little bit counts exactly <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, did anybody else have anything they wanted to add before we move on? Okay, great. Um, so I kind of wanted to hear about like maybe what skills or like um, expertise you've learned in other areas of your career that have kind of helped you move your creative practice forward. Um, so whether that's like grant writing or, um, teaching that kind of a thing, um, yeah, just kind of curious, um, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I, uh, you know, I mentioned in 2014, making this leap to, you know, becoming a full time artist. But I should say that, you know, it went hand in hand with me deciding to go back to school. Um, so I was very strategic in my efforts. I was thinking, you know, what are the things that I could do in the day that would fund me to be able to do this exploration that I want to do. And one of the things that I knew was that I needed a lot of time. And one of the things that uh, that led me to was this idea of, I know you might not think I want to do a PhD so that I can have more time. But for me, I was like, I want to do a PhD and do a practice based PhD where I get to make the work that I would want to make anyways, but have graduate funding to be able to do it. And that little bit of graduate funding and I mean, I, I received some like I received a Vanier scholarship and I received um, a SLIF fellowship. And so, you know, I was, I was very lucky to get uh, some, some funding, but it wasn't huge, but it was enough. It was enough just to make it possible that I didn't have to stress to be hustling, 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 to be able to take this chance at trying out making work. And what I found was that with more time, I could say yes to more things. Now, I've that's a problem where I've, you know, now created a monster and I have to like learn <laughs> and, treat and t teach myself how to say no to things. But, you know, I was able in that period of having more time to say yes to more things. So I got to travel more. I got to show my work in different places because I was able to go because I didn't have to check with a boss. Can I have this week off? Can I, you know, I could just say yes and just, you know, take these opportunities that were coming. Um, and then I will say, you know, you know, I've had a lot of success through the granting system. And, you know, a lot of that is come through actually sitting on the juries because that really helps to uh, strengthen your grantsmanship is it mm -hmm. when you're actually reading, uh, you know, hundreds of applications, some grant juries, you only have to read 30, but some of them you have to read like 100 or 150 applications. And, you know, you really get a sense of the ones that catch the reader and the ones that don't. And it helps you when you're writing your grant to be able to say, you know, you know, how can I be as clear and concise as that grant application that we all loved that we ranked 15 out of 15 you know and uh you know so so being on the juries was really helpful uh in terms of strengthening my grant writing skills um and then i've recently just uh i'm just about to complete a three-year canada council composite grant and that was something that was a really a great thing you know i encourage everybody to uh, get their profile set up with canada council and apply for some small grants because when you've applied for two you're eligible to apply for the three year funding and the three year funding is just such a game changer because you're not having to put in for every small project that you want to do you can build in mentorships you can build in residencies you can build in exhibitions into your three-year plan and get funding for 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 all of that so um you know i really encourage people to do that and then you know i've really found a lot of it turns out when i did my phd uh it turns out that i really like teaching you know i didn't know that I wanted to, do. I was in the education department at the AGO, so I knew I loved edu like education, but it turns out I really liked teaching. So I ended up deciding to, you know, start teaching in an art school. Um, and uh, I have the opportunity now to be able to teach um, uh, other uh, emerging artists. And um, that de definitely supports my practice although at this point it, as i say it's uh you know it's a it's a push pull with time you know the more that you add other work in even though it's it's like that famous phrase you know when i had no money i had all the time to make the work that i wanted to make but i didn't have the funds to make the project and then <laughs> you, know, you get the money for the project because you're working but then you don't have time to work on the project but you have the funds to do it so it's like you know it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a, a push pull that you have to figure out but anyways teaching school uh, these were things that helped to supplement me uh, to the point where i was able to have more time and then of course with more time you know i produced more work i was able to have stronger support material for my grant applications i was able to you know do different things now that i'm in uh, academia i'm suddenly open up to this world of academic grants which was 
uh, previously not accessible um, uh, to me before. So, uh, and they have this whole other categorization uh, for our work that they call research creation. And it sounds so fancy, but it's really just a way for them to categorize and understand what we do as artists, you know, that we're trying to answer questions um, through the work that we're making. So I'm trying to learn that system. I'm not very good at it yet, but I'm trying to learn how to write academic grants so that I could apply for this different pot. So anyways, there's lots of opportunities out there, but, you know, looking at, you know, the idea of going back to school as a potential time creating possibility, as opposed to a time limiting possibility is something that I would offer. That's great. Really good advice. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to go next? Um, uh, I think one of the interesting skills I picked up was when my art started getting more attention on Instagram, particularly when I had my art affirmation series going, which I did for five years, um, I started getting a lot of offers to do workshops, like just de-stressing art workshops. And those have actually been a very, um, consistent source of, of income. I mean, it's not like you don't get like a ton per workshop, but it's been something that I've consistently been doing over the years. Um, and that's not something I ever thought that I would do because um, again, like I, I, I didn't go to school for art. I went to school for journalism and then I kind of did that freelance. And then I realized that um, it wasn't really right for me. Um, so when I started getting the opportunity to do these like de-stressing workshops I was kind of like oh my gosh like how am I going to lead a workshop like I don't you know I'm not I, I so just imposter syndrome like I just didn't really feel like it was something I could do but it was cool it was really just like leading people through really basic art exercises and the whole point was like de-stressing and hanging out and creating a space where people also like, didn't feel judged for making like bad art because it's like <laughs> there's no way for you to make bad art and again like I you know I'm not so super technically proficient like I can't make a giant super photorealistic oil painting or something like that you know what I mean trying to like encourage people that um sometimes like the act of creating art is what's really amazing rather than necessarily the final product so it was really cool getting to do workshops and that's something I've consistently done so um sometimes you know when you're making visual art or even like writing I've done writing workshops like you think that the only thing that you can get money for is like the final product, but actually like there's income to be had of just share, like sharing your skills with people. Um, Cause it's like most of these workshops are funded by like universities and like things like that. So like they have honorariums and, and stuff like that. And it's like free for people to attend. Um, and so that, that was a really interesting skill to learn. It's just like how to like get people to feel comfortable sitting down and doing an exercise and like getting, getting people to feel comfortable making art if it's not something that they've ever done before because so many people are like oh I don't know how to draw so like why would I attend and it's like you don't have to know how to draw like it's just for fun so um that that that's been a really cool skill so it sometimes you're forced to adapt to a skill because you get an opportunity that you didn't think was gonna happen but now you're like okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna learn how to do this I'm gonna learn how to facilitate a workshop um so that's that's been something really cool that's awesome. I love that. And I'm sure, you know, like people love just like spending time with artists they admire too, where it's like, exactly. you know, like, yeah, it's, people just want to like hang out and make <laughs> art in a zone that's like judgment free. And sometimes also people won't take out time out of their day to sit and make art because they're kind of told that like, that is like a waste of time unless it's lucrative or monetized in some way. So when people, when you provide the space to do a workshop or like a class, it's, it's letting people say like, okay, I'm going to sign up for this, which means I am allocating this time towards just creating for creation's sake. And it doesn't have to amount to anything else. It doesn't have to be a credential. It's just for me to relax. It's nice being able to provide that space for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like because we are living in capitalism, it's so hard for people to just, even artists, to just make for the sake of making. Um, so it's a, a really big gift we can give to ourselves, I think. <laughs> awesome. All right, Brianne. 
So when you asked this question, I was like, oh gosh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I know um, you do so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so the question was, what skills have been most helpful? Is that? Yeah, like uh, kind of what skills that you've learned in other areas of your career that have kind of helped you move your creative process forward or your pre creative practice forward? But you can really um, speak to whatever you'd like to speak, honestly. Okay, no, you're good. I'm just also trying to think of like what would be most helpful for folks that are watching. Um, I think what has been really helpful, this is gonna sound so woo-woo, but just buckle up everyone. Mm -hmm. I think what's really been really helpful for me is um, intuitive analytics skills. So when we when we say when I say analytics, people can get like, oh gosh, remembering like your fifth grade math teacher who was like horrible to you. Well, something that I've learned that's really helped me in my art practice is being able to look at like data of what people are searching and what they're looking for, and then how I can make art that meets that need. And so for me, I'm in this like really interesting overlap of like influencer, blogger marketing and creating like weird creative work that makes a good number of brands go like, what is she doing, which is fun. So I think if I was going to give anybody advice, I would say that like taking or like just learning how to interpret information from the internet as to like what people are looking for. Not necessarily, I don't mean that like, oh, this Instagram post got X number of likes. That's not what I mean. I mean like, and like looking at the comments and, and kind of entering like an energetic interaction with people that you're engaging with in your art practice or in your business or in your work to have a better idea of where they're coming from and seeing trends and then being able to like do things there. In a more concrete way, I would also say that like workshops and teaching courses, um, I might are rough. Like I throw up a page on my website with like a fun photo of myself. I put together the curriculum. I don't make the curriculum and tell people like the actual slides or anything until people have registered. And then I just do them in Facebook groups because that's just the most accessible platform that people know how it works. I've tried others and it uh, has been like terrible. So don't recommend, but um, if there, if you have people like in your DMs or people telling, asking for your advice on specific topics, and it could be anything from like, you know, rent, how do you like rent a space for silversmithing to um, like, how do I make a square space for my website? Like if you have people in, in your DMs or comments or like when you're meeting people in real life and they're asking you questions, like that could be a workshop or a course that you teach. And then for me, I've taken those funds to then go do really fun like art projects in the desert in Utah. So just, yep, I think that's, yep, I'm good. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually took an Instagram course from you um, and it was amazing. It was super helpful. I really enjoyed it. And like, yeah, like it was a good way, a good way to connect with you too and connect with other artists as well. So um, yeah, I think... I think I, I love the idea of like, yeah, um, turning in, turning things that people are curious about with your art practice into some sort of um, teaching opportunity. Um, I think that's really, really awesome approach. Um, this is uh, just the past little conversation we were having kind of made me want to ask this question, um, which is just... I think a lot of people in our region, a lot of artists, uh, we are also activists. Um, we are also like uh, doing decolonizing work and also um, trying to survive in end stage capitalism basically. And um, it can be, I think for a lot of artists, uh, it can be hard to like, make money because you don't believe in capitalism but like we exist in capitalism so I'm just curious if anyone has um things to share about kind of how you resolve that um for yourself or your approach or your strategy or even just like kind of how you think about it um yeah does that resonate with anyone or have anybody want to share something about that
I don't know how to answer this question. It's That's really okay. Question. That's uh, okay. You don't have to. I, uh, <laughs> I think it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to try to, you know, make money and be successful online and everything while also sticking with your values. Um, and I do think that sometimes when you do make work that is very political, sometimes that will hinder certain opportunities, but I do it anyways because um, I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I saw all, not all my artwork is, is political. Some of it's just pretty general, I guess, but um, occasionally I have made something that was political and, um, I find that when I do make things like, for example, I've, I've made a lot of artwork about police abolition. And I find that when I make those types of posts, they do get a lot of engagement, but they also sometimes get picked up by the wrong people. And it can, you know what I mean? So there's also like, I understand people wanting to protect themselves online. And the fear of sometimes putting some of those things out there, especially when you have experience online hate, it can be really hard to navigate that. So this is a hard one to answer. I think I think it just depends on on your comfort level of how you want to balance those things. Um, you know, I know people who've, you know, will will take like an influencer deal or something like that. And like I'm not gonna, you know, judge a person for, I don't know, like promoting some random brand or something if they're just trying to pay rent do you know what I mean totally. um I think it comes down to questions like if you do have a lot of income and you have the op the the option to say no to certain opportunities because it doesn't align with you that's super great and and you should if you have that option opportunity then you should stick to your guns but I understand that some people don't have that opportunity like you're literally just trying to pay your rent um, so it's very hard to navigate. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, similarly, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's complex, you know, because we're, we're trying to, I make very political work, um, you know, work that is, you know, explicitly about community or about activism or about our, our lived experiences. And so I think a lot about, you know what it means to uh, yeah you know definitely uh, my work was um heavily criticized when i was in art school because everyone was making postmodernism at the time in the 90s and political work wasn't de rigueur uh you know now the political work is more uh taken up in in the zeitgeist and in, in popular culture so there's more opportunities um but i often you know pull it have this push pull and really um uh think about the choices that i i make about these kind of things so i'm just in the process of uh, having a an art gallery acquisition some banners that i made uh into their collection and i'm agreeing to to do it because i really love this gallery and i think having these banners more accessible than say in a ikea bag in the bottom of my studio closet you know these banners could be used in the public you know in public conversation and dialogue that feels really appealing but it also feels really important that because these are you know aesthetics that come from activism that the funds that I'm going to get from this acquisition go back into communities. So I've already started to work with um, a group called Uplift Black, which is uh, doing incredible work in this rural community near where I grew up. I grew up between Toronto and Memphis, but also up in Muskoka and uh, spent a lot of time in this rural uh, community where I was often the only black person and they're doing some incredible work at Uplift Black in the Barry Simcoe region. And so I'm going to be donating, um, you know, the, the sales to Uplift Black for this particular project. So I'm in a financial position where I can do that, where I can choose this project is maybe gonna, you know, fund something and this project is gonna go back to community and and and, and, I, and I have the opportunity to sort of think through that. And then the other thing I would say about this is that, you know, it's funny because um, 
I've been an artist for a long time. I've been an artist for 26 years and, you know, there it's now, you know, and now I'm at a stage in my career where my work is being acquisitioned into these museums and galleries, but, you know, a lot of the attention sort of in the general sphere uh, up for my work actually comes from people interacting with my Instagram. So, you know, even though it seems like such a little thing to post a meme carousel in the morning while I'm having my coffee, it's, it, it, it's doing something because then people are like, oh, I saw your Instagram and it reminded me of your work, this work, and it made me want to get in touch with you about this thing. So um, anyways, there's lots of opportunities to be had from just being present, um, but then also just thinking through, you know, I really resonated with what you were saying, um, Hannah, about this idea of like what what you what you're willing to like. You kind of have to have a bit of a a moral um, um, policy for yourself about what your where your line is, um, like you know, and what you're willing to to promote and what you're not going to promote and what you're going to take funds from and what you're not going to take funds from and when it's important to give back back into the community and when it's okay for it to go into supporting your family or whatever you know so just really having a sense of that yourself before you go into it and then kind of following and if you get those questions where you're like i don't really know what to do here you can go back to that personal policy that you have for yourself and see if it's an alignment and if it is you know then you can make a certain decision and if it isn't then you can make a different decision i love that that's really really good approach to have and I feel like also that would that's going to change you know your line might change depending on how resourced or not resourced you are too um yeah that's great thank you this is one of my favorite <laughs> topics to talk about on um social media specifically um money and abundance and one of my very best friends is a trans ballet dancer. Their name's Logan. And um, we talk about this a lot. And uh, they said something to me that's really helped me. And it is that abundance is knowing that more is always coming. So instead of having to like, feel like you have to like take everything and like run off into the night with it because you're worried that more isn't coming, like abundance is knowing that other stuff is coming down the line. And so that kind of mindset has helped me to say no to things that I can financially say no to. But I, again, I really appreciate um, how y'all mentioned, like, <laughs> this is a no judgment space. We're all just trying to eat. Um, the second thing that I remind myself is, is that money is a unit of exchange and I'm not gonna get weird and like libertarian. So just like, hold on, don't freak out everyone. But so money is a unit of exchange. And you know, hundreds of years ago, if we were like living in a village, maybe without currency, artists were paid with things like maybe like a goat from somebody's goat herd or people would bring you bread or like there's like different ways um, all over the world that artists have been like supported by their community. So when people come to pay an artist, I just remember like this, we've just decided that this is the most simple like means of exchange versus like, um, I'm really thinking more of like in like Ireland. Anyways, I don't need to go into that. But anyway, so you don't feeling guilt about getting paid for your artwork while i understand where that comes from from like a late capitalism framework it is helpful to take a step back and be like this actually probably makes more sense that somebody's helping me pay my phone bill this month versus um like they made a blanket for me and like shipped it across the country you know so that can also be helpful um as well and then i think the last thing that i would say about um figuring out money in abundance is I always remind myself that when somebody buys something from you as an artist, you might not, not all the time, but often it's like a discretionary purchase. Um, it, you know, we're not dentists. So people are deciding to use that part of their budget um, or of their income to buy artwork from you. So it's, the money's going to be spent somewhere, right? Like it might be with you or they might like 
take their friends and family to go see a movie that weekend or something. But in my experience, and I'm trying to be really careful in my language here, in my experience, if you're getting paid for something as an artist or like specifically like a physical work or even like a digital piece of artwork, um, people are not in, are not in my experience, it's like their excess. Does that make sense? Like you don't have to feel guilty about taking payment for your artwork because it's not like you're selling insulin at like a huge up charge or something <laughs> like that. Like that you're not an evil person. So yeah. Right. Yeah. I like I get what you're saying. It's like people were gonna spend that money on something extra, probably. So why not you? <laughs> That's great. Uh, awesome. Well, we're uh, kind of wrapping up to this for the questions I have. I've got maybe one more and then did want to open it up to any of the attendees. Um, so if you are watching and you have a question, um, you can go ahead and uh, put it in the chat box and or send it to Kaylee directly. Um, and then we'll kind of look at those um, toward the end here. Uh, so I guess the last question I was thinking about was around, um, I don't know if you could kind of think back, um, to maybe before you like made your leap into pursuing your artwork, um, like that younger version of yourself, like what kind of advice would you give them? I, I have so much to say. Oh my God. <laughs> awesome. um, I, I, when I wanted to do art, I did not have a lot of support around it. Um, and I did not, I, I knew that I really loved art. I knew that it felt good to make art, but I felt completely lost because I was like, my inner dialogue was, well, you're not naturally talented. You don't have the technical proficiency. You don't have the education. Like, how are you going to make it work? And it was a struggle. I mean, I, I spent the last five years, I worked retail and um, I have a different job now doing uh, graphic design, which is a shock to me, <laughs> but I was doing retail and sometimes people would come in who were customers who were like, um, and they would like recognize me from Instagram, which didn't happen a lot, but occasionally it did. And they'd be like, oh, I'm shocked that you work here. And it's like, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to make ends meet. But I think that when I was trying to get into it, I told myself, like, if you're not doing this full time, like you're a failure. Mm -hmm. And that was like the dialogue that I was giving myself. When I accepted, you know what, whichever way I create art is valid, no matter what else I'm doing in my life to make ends meet, that's what's important. And so I kind of wish someone had said to me, however you want to start this practice, even if you want to start it in a really, really small way, that in and of itself is, is, is valid. Yes, you are an artist. You wanna sit down and make art. You wanna sit down maybe an hour after you're done your day job and type up how you wanna write a book or something like that. Like even if it's a very small step and you don't know if it's, you might not know if it's ever gonna see the light of day or if it's ever gonna get past your Instagram, like it still matters, you know? Art is important. Creating things is important. You're contributing to society, to culture, to community by sharing your work with people and by making stuff. Even if you're not doing it in, you know, the grandest way or the way that you had imagined or the way society says is successful. And so I don't think that people should limit themselves of like, well, I can't create art unless I rework my whole life. Start with making art where your life is right now. You know what I mean? Like, like start where you are right now, see where it goes. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's really great advice. Really great advice. Thank you for sharing. I would, I would just build on that and say, you know, I thought this, um, I thought I had to move. I thought I had to move. I thought I, in order to be an artist and to be successful, 
I had to move it. I live in a pretty big city already, but I thought, so then I was like, well, you have to move to New York, you know, you have to move to LA, you have to move to the, you know, and, and it turns out you don't, <laughs> you don't, you could actually choose where you want to live based on how it makes you feel, what your community is like, what support networks you have, you know, what the env natural environment is like. You, like, you can choose where you live and, and, and just, as you say, just start making art, you know, start making art where you're at. Um, you don't actually have to move, especially now with things, so much stuff being online, you really don't have to move. Um, so that would be one thing I wish I had known then, cause I wouldn't have spent so many anguished years, you know, trying to get into NYU and trying to go and do all these things in the States. Um, I think that there's, you know, this idea that, uh, that you're going to know when, like that there's going to be this sort of moment when when everything is going to be sort of crystal clear about what you need to be doing in your art practice and just to say uh that moment may, may never come <laughs> it's okay to be a little bit muddled or to be not quite sure and to go with emergence and to follow the mystery you know i think i i also you know i left art school um you know thinking that i should have some sort of like you know step-by-step -step plan and instead I ended up following the mystery uh, and the great mystery of this life. And, uh, you know, I'm so thankful that I did, you know, because it has taken me in all these directions. I ended up um, saying yes to writing a play for the Toronto Biennial. Uh, and then uh, through that ended up, turn it turns out that I love theater and ended up making more theater. And now I teach in a theater and film program at a university and love it, you know, but I would have never thought that, you know, just 10 years ago, it would have, I would have said, oh, I'm only doing drawing and visual art. I, I, I'm not interested in theater. So following the mystery, following emergence, you don't have to move and, um, you know, celebrate all the little moments uh, if you can, you know, with your community. So if you get a grant for 500 bucks, you know, pop the champagne corks, celebrate that, <laughs> celebrate all of the little wins um, because, you know, they all add up. And, you know, if your work gets shown somewhere, um, you know, it doesn't have to be in a gallery for it to be considered valuable. Like just put your work up there. I mean, Emery Douglas was putting his work in the streets, mm -hmm. you know, and making the streets the gallery. So uh, just celebrate all of the steps along the way because this is a journey and it's a process. And my grandmother is 96, she's an artist. She's been an artist her whole life. And, you know, she's just done it one foot in front of the other. She, you know, she she's really just continued to make work that interests her. And I think that that would be something that I would say is a good a good idea. That's great. Follow the mystery. I like it. And also for all us rural queers <laughs> in Canada, we don't have to move. We can stay here. <laughs> we can enjoy the mountains. Um, that's great. Uh, Brianne. I just want to take a moment and say this energy of this session is just really so lovely. So thanks to everyone for like putting that out there and really enjoying this. Um, <clears throat> I think that the other folks said what I was going to say. The only thing that I would add is um, it's okay to make work that doesn't look like what you think it's going to look like in your mind. I am just now years into this finally being able to execute on what is in my brain um, and like make fabric do what I like wanted it to do in my mind. And I've learned that you kind of, you don't need to force it or like be mean to yourself through it, but you do kind of have to just like work through learning how to make what is in here show up outside of yourself and to just give yourself grace and space to look at things and be like, you know what, that really, that's not what I wanted, <laughs> but it's a stepping stone. And we're going to, I always tell myself, like, we're going to create through it. We're going to create through it and move on to the next thing. We can always revisit it. Like it can be iterative. So yeah, there you go. That's great. Awesome. Well, thanks uh, for all your contributions to the conversation. I, I personally got a lot out of it. I know other people are going to get a lot out of it as well. Um, so we're going to hop over and see if there's any questions. To yes. Um, I can't see myself, but I think maybe 
We can see you. Okay. You can, uh, you can, okay. <laughs> yes. <we can. laughs> well, you can hear me regardless. Yeah. Um, I've got four questions here. Um, and I think I can actually match them into two and two. They, they okay. kind of come together really nicely. Um, so there's a, a couple questions here around transitioning into new mediums. Do you have any thoughts on learning new art mediums and forms alongside your main body of work job or present focus in life? Um, and attached to that, I'm also going to add on um, this question that's specifically about wanting to explore well, the specific context of this artist is they're looking to explore more functional art by making textiles, weird lamps, and homewares. That sounds like a super fantastic uh, practice. Do you have any advice on how to transition from traditional art mediums or what spaces might be more accepting of this kind of art? Uh, so related questions there about moving into new mediums and how you do that alongside your established practice. Um, and what do you do if you're moving into a radically different form and trying to find a home for it? Well, I will say that I went from being primarily a visual artist who did some performance art, and I mean like weird performance art, you know, like where you're, you know, standing in a, I don't know, in a subway tunnel with a red umbrella. I don't know, like I would do sort of a strange performance art. I, I, I took a big leap and, and started doing theater and working in a very different medium, and I found it challenging at first because you know, I applied to some theater grants and didn't get them, whereas I had a lot of success with visual arts grants and, you know, I'm making work, but didn't go to theater school and like, you know, does this make sense? Is this legible? Is this, you know, working? Um, but I've just persisted. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that is the magic of us getting to be artists. We've been taught that you have to stay in these silos of music and visual art and drama and that they never come together. And the reality is, is that, you know, you can have an interdisciplinary practice and it is, you know, perfectly great, wonderful, you know, to move from dance to music to, to theater and, and back again uh, and to see what happens and what you can create only by moving into this new medium that you want to explore. And I think that maybe that goes back to this idea of thinking of our work as research creation, like even though there's weird things that academics have to somehow categorize our work in that way, but this idea that we are uh, following a line of inquiry and whatever medium is the best track for answering those questions, you should go for it, you know, and it doesn't have to be, well, I'm a drawer, so I have to do it as a drawing, you know, uh, so I, I, you know, I encourage that. And I would, you know, if you can try to connect with community members who are working in the medium that you're working in. And if you're doing something completely different that maybe nobody else is doing, invite people to come and play with you, invite people to come into your, into your little bubble, into your circle, so that you can have some sort of generative uh, exchange and feedback um, and just keep persevering. I would say, just keep trying. Um, and, and again, you may end up uh, experimenting for a couple of years and then decide that you're done with that experiment and that's okay too. Uh, none of these things are uh, unsuccessful. They're just part of the process of going along. Absolutely. Um, I want to add to that. Uh, so when I was uh, doing my affirmation series, it was like digital art and it was pretty popular. When I ended the series and I started to I don't even want to say pursue a new art style because actually I was going back to my old art style that I had been doing before anyone other than my friends followed me on Instagram. And when I did that, I actually uh, saw a big drop in followers, big, big drop in followers, big loss engagement. The thing about social media, especially Instagram, is it often doesn't reward growth. It rewards brand consistency. Um, and don't listen to that. Do it anyways. Do the new thing anyways, because I could have stuck with the formula that was working, but I would not have been pleased with myself as an artist if I had done that. So absolutely do the new thing. It's scary. First, also be prepared to suck at the new thing, because when you try new things, you're usually bad at it first and that's great it's great to be bad at something 
you're trying everything out, everything's new. And when you suck at something too, each little thing that you manage to do right feels so even better. Like I started messing around with clay and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but when something actually stuck, I was like, this is awesome <laughs> because I know I'm not an expert in it. So I feel more free to do, to just go at it and make mistakes. It's very freeing actually to try something that's new, you know, because you, you, you surrender your expectations. Whereas when you're doing something you've always done, sometimes you can give into obsessiveness and perfectionism that you haven't done it right. Um, but be, be prepared to know that not everybody wants you to grow or try new things. A lot of people want you to stay in the same consistent spot, you know, like that you've always been in. So, but do it anyways, because it's great. <laughs> I love it. I love that. So I feel like sometimes I'm more like tactical, like here's your three tips to do things. Let me grab some. <laughs> and while Brian's grabbing that, I'm just going to highlight that there was a really great recommendation for a Facebook group called Weirdos Market. If you Ooh. have some funky art stuff you're looking to, to find, um, find some homes for. Uh, and there was a fantastic book recommendation as well that was passed along. Uh, Dr. Tannis McDonald apparently wrote an amazing book for rural small town artists called Out of Line. It's a great read for those feeling isolated or like they need to move. That was a recommendation from CJ. Definitely going to pick up that book. I think that's fantastic. That'd be great. Will you say the Facebook uh, group name again? Yeah, I popped it in the chat. It's called Weirdos Market. Love it joining right after this. <laughs> I love that. So All my right. just quick tip is, um, so I've been like, I don't know if this happens to anybody else, but you, you feel like the like sirens call of a specific medium and you're like, oh God, I do not have room for that at my house. And then you're like secretly like at 2 a.m. like Googling like tutorials and stuff. So what I started to do for oil painting at least was in the last year, I just asked friends and family for um, different holidays and for birthdays and stuff. I just like had like a list of materials for oil painting that people could gift for me, gift to me to explore a new medium. And that worked out really well. And um, so my family also really enjoyed doing that. And then another thing that I weirdly found helpful when wanting to explore a new medium, but like not being sure how to go about doing it is to offer to clean the studio or the space. So, you know, art can be messy, whether you're doing like theater or clay or whatever, that there's stuff everywhere. And I found by just showing up first with like um, a desire to like help and connect that I've then found myself in spaces of like, oh yeah, we do this like, weekly thing every Tuesday and Thursday where we each teach each other how to do something. And so just showing up and offering to like help clean up spaces um, has been a good way for me to like find workshops or like meet people in different mediums that I might not have known. And I know that not everybody can like show up and do that kind of physical labor, but there are like other things digitally online. And um, if you just kind of show up with an attitude of what can I help you with versus like, how can I get you to like, how can I socially maneuver and machinate to like get you to teach me how to do this thing? I think that that works a lot better. Thank you for sharing, that's great. All right, round two, yeah. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Someone has to say, oh, we are muted at least once every <laughs> webinar. Yeah, exactly. Every We've Happy to be that person this time. Uh, so there's a, a few questions here around specific digital platforms. Um, you mentioned Patreon, Hannah, and one other, and we're trying to remember what that was. It was coffee. It's coffee. K-O-F-I. K-O-F-I. So K-O-F-I. Right. And, and re related to that, there's a, a question around adding a tip option on your shop. Does anyone have experience having a support the artist shop button? Um, yeah, I, I'm on Medium and they just put a tip function there. Anyone have any um, experience uh, with that? Yeah, I had, I had a tip 
option on my online store. Um, and people did, people did use it occasionally. Sometimes people would tip me like, cause I offered like local delivery um, for free within like a certain radius. So sometimes people would tip me for that or like, I've noticed sometimes people would tip me just to round the number to like an even number. So like if they bought a print and it was 12 bucks and then the shipping was like $2, they would just like round it to 15 or like round it to 20 or something like that. So like, it is nice to have things like that. Um, and I think it's also, it's great to tip an artist, but I have the option available, obviously, like people weren't obligated to, but yeah, it's, it's totally a normal thing to do. That's great. That's really good to hear, actually. And there's another quick piece to that as well. Um, a question specifically around, do you need better recording equipment for making Patreon content or do you just use your phone? Um, I don't do videos anyways on my Patreon, but 100% you can just use a phone. I mean, like most phones now have pretty good cameras. So un unless your phone is like a flip phone, you'll, you'll be fine. It, de it depends if it, like if you do really want to like make like certain kinds of really like super cool content. Like, yeah, you might need something else, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with just starting out with a phone. Most people, I mean, there's people on TikTok who get, who have like millions of followers who just make like, <laughs> like random shaky videos on their phone. So like, I, I don't think people are picky as long as they're interested. Absolutely. I would just say, use your phone. I think about Chani Nicholas who's quite well known, who makes her video holding on to her little um, <laughs> wired headphone thing with the microphone that doesn't quite pick up her voice. And she literally is holding it. Uh, this is Shani Nicholas, right? So if she can do it, you can do it. Like, uh, and I would also say, you know, I shot a video for the Biennial uh, and the Ryerson Image Center and it was eight uh, video, eight channel, huge, massive, took the entire width of the wall uh, at the Ryerson Image Center because it was shot in 4K. Well, now iPhone uh, 14s and 12s and 11s shoot in 4K. So like literally we could do on, on my phone what I did with this expensive camera that the biennial paid for to make this video. Now you could just do on your phone. So the cameras are actually really good. They shoot in 4K, most of them. And that's not even getting into the Androids. The Androids shoot are, are even better with the cameras. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I mean, people kind of want, I think, I don't think people are looking for um, Hollywood studio effects in your Patreon. I think they want the personal story. They want to know you. They want to, like, they're buying into supporting you and your practice and your work. And so they want to know a little bit about your story. So you holding your phone, it, nothing's more intimate than that. So I, I would say just use your phone. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, and companies are spending, like, millions of dollars right now trying to figure out how to make content that looks like what we in the business we call it UGC <laughs> user generated content and it's like a it's a there everybody I'm just watching you know any kind of you, I think some, one of you mentioned like watching things on Twitter with popcorn it's one of those things that I watch on Twitter with my popcorn so if these big brands are like trying to make it look like they're shooting things on their phone then you're you're fine it, and I mean, just to just to piggyback on that, like the Tiffany and Co ads that are all over Instagram that don't, aren't branded as ads, and that somehow Instagram doesn't make them say as branded content, but it's just happens to be Beyonce and Jay Z lounging, but with all of their jewels on, or it just happens to be Julia Roberts like checking herself in the kit in, in her mirror, but she's got like huge diamonds, and it's like, and then you know, and they're all Tiffany, and I'm like, wait a minute, these are ads, but they look like they're just you know, a casual behind the scenes day of the star's life where yep. she happened to take a photo wearing all this jewelry. So I think that that would be a, probably a really good example that people have seen of this user generated content look, you know, where they've tried to look, like, wait a minute. I mean, wh who's filmed, like who's, anyways, yeah. but this is what they're doing. Yeah, just picture uh, a bunch. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I just wanted to add, like, if you are concerned um, about, if anything, like just get a ring light Cause sometimes like I had trouble like using my phone just cause like I have terrible lighting in my apartment. I don't get really natural light in here. And like, I, you can get it. I literally have like a setup like right here. It, it's just like a little thing. And it's just got like a little, you know, thingy. And it, this was like, I don't know, 20 bucks or something. So. 
that'll help. Yeah, lighting, lighting, lighting is a good idea. Um, also, fun fact: Channing Nicholas is actually from the area that we're. Um, yeah, uh, Channing grew up here in the Kootenays. Oh, amazing! So full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess, do we have any more questions, Kaylee? Uh, no more questions have been submitted during the session, but we did have interest uh, during the registration um, questions around pu publishing. I, I, it came up a little bit. If, I think any last thoughts on how that has fit into your career? Um, I think some folks might find that helpful. Hmm. Yeah, I've done a lot of uh, publishing at this point point um I have a couple of maybe three or four books out and then a couple of kids books out and one of the books uh until we are free the making of black lives matter in canada uh it became a bestseller so it's it's sold really well uh during the uprisings of 2020 we, we released the book to the we're like oh yay we're just about to start a book tour march 2020 and then of course the world was like just joking you're not but you know the book still ended up traveling around just uh in its own networks so um you know i do have some experience with publishing and it's been really amazing actually to get to um you know just tell some really good stories uh and i mean it's a process uh if we're thinking about these artistic components and we've talked about bite-sized things like things that you can just do in your morning and things that take longer i mean the books take longer i mean um if you're doing a with a publishing house um, as opposed to a DIY publication, you know, there's a, it, it can sometimes take two years. It can sometimes take, you know, from start to finish. So sometimes even, even a little bit longer. Uh, so just building that time into your plan, I kind of have like a couple of book proposals on the go while I'm finishing another book so that I'm kind of constantly getting things out there. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting. Uh, and there's certainly more and more, publishing houses willing to take a chance on art books because um, art books don't always sell in the same way. So, but I'm seeing more and more publishers wanting to have books of images and books of, um, of visual art. So hopefully that's a trend that will continue. Um, uh, but yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely say if anyone's interested, I'm happy to chat more offline about it, but um, you know, just to get your ideas down of what it is you might want to make a book about or make a publication about. You don't have to go through a publishing house. There are lots of in indie publishing houses as well as DIY publications and self-publishing. But if you want to go through a major, you know, a major publishing house, you know, they have usually on their website what a proposal is, re what, what's required in a proposal for them. And it's often just a summary of what it is you're planning on doing. And then a little bit about how it relates to other books on the market. Um, so putting those kind of things together can be a little bit of a practice but you can kind of get into a rhythm with them um and yeah it's really fun that's great uh, did you have anything else to add oh no i think that was great awesome. I, yeah, I don't have any dad cool the one thing that i would add is uh twitter can be really helpful for the publishing industry there are a lot of agents that are sharing what they're looking for um, you can find indie publishing houses on Twitter using the search feature. So Twitter is is definitely like one of the main places where you can just go and meet people in publishing. And I think that Twitter is kind of like a town square. Anybody can talk to anyone for good or for bad. So don't be afraid to just show up in somebody's replies and talk to them if they're sharing publicly. Awesome. That's great. Well, I think um, I think we might be wrapping up our evening. Um, I really enjoyed my time with you all, and I know folks here are really going to get a lot out of what you shared, um, and it's been such a treat. So thank you for, for showing up. Yay, uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. 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 Bye.